Hello everybody, welcome once again to another installment right here of A Rebel Without Applause. Coming to you as I always do, live and recorded the whole thing from this, my little nutshell of infinite space, my television studio apartment located right here in the wood of the holly in the enchanted creative cradle known as Cretona under the sign, all of which overlooks a not-so-COVID-addled land of law. Those of us that are vaxxed have a free pass to no mask happiness. But that's not the subject here today. We have a very special guest. He is one of the premier NBA bracketologists. He is an expert in all things hoop. He's got people with every franchise, everything you want to know. He's got it right here, especially with the playoffs just around the corner. Of course, for those of us in La La Land, the primary concern is the Lakers. Can they repeat? That's the big question. I don't know. Yeah, a lot to cover in today's episode, and I'm honored to be on the show. <laughs> Thank you for bringing me on. I miss talking sports, talking NBA. People are asking, can the Lakers repeat? I'm not so sure if they can repeat. I, I'm, I'm curious to know if they can get out of the Western Conference and even, well, forget the Western Conference. Can they get out of the play-in tournament? Which... Seriously, the, yeah, the NBA decided to add this new feature. I feel like it was bad timing, you know, because they, they're, trying to get, they're trying to get some more money out of it. You know, it's kind of a money grab, but it could work against them if the Lakers were somehow to lose. I mean, that's the biggest, one of the biggest franchises in the league. So if they're not going to make the playoffs, they're going to lose a lot of money. Right, but it also adds a level of competition on the lower tier of the playoffs. I mean, it, it, it creates another week of drama. If Had they not had the playoff, uh, the play-in tournament, there's really not much drama coming into the playoffs. It limits the amount of teams that can kind of cruise, and you've got three or four teams scuffling uh, to make the playoffs, including the Golden State Warriors, mm -hmm. who are, might be a dark horse if they can get in. Seems like right now we're going to be playing the, the Warriors in that 7 8 seeding game. Do you think the Lakers benefit from the play in tournament? Maybe uh, they need those extra games, hopefully with LeBron in the mix, to, to kind of gel and, and find a chemistry that they really haven't had an opportunity to develop with their stars. They might benefit from it. Yeah, I mean, because it also gives them sort of a sense of urgency that they have to play with right now. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of seeing the team like really have to get their stuff together right now so that they actually make the playoffs and it's kind of forcing the THTs and all the guys other than AD, LeBron and Schroeder to really like figure out how to win without our core team. You know, you're seeing THT rise to the occasion now. You're seeing guys like Wesley Matthews and Kuzma. They're having to do things that granted it took like, you know, a whole stretch of games where they lost and got beat badly, mm -hmm. which kind of like was demoralizing a little bit. But now I, f I feel like we're, we've won four of the last six. Uh, you're starting to see these guys click a little more. And it's, it's good to know, like, once LeBron and AD come back, that these guys are going to have a sense of confidence that they may not have had um, if LeBron wasn't out, AD wasn't out, and they didn't have to, like, fight to get into this, to try to get out of the play-in, but it looks like they're still going to be in it. When I look at this young guy, THT, Taylor Horton Tucker, I mean, he looks like he could be... I don't know if he's the two guard or the one guard in the future. I'm starting to see Caruso and THT as maybe a pretty powerful guard duo uh, moving forward. What's your what's your feeling about this guy? I mean, he's so young. Like, this is his pretty much his rookie season. So it's pretty impressive what he's been able to do off the bat. Like, I remember seeing him in preseason, and I, I remember my dad made a comment. He's like, "This guy's good," and I didn't believe him. And then. You know, now we're later down the line and, you know, he had like 20 points, 10 assists the other day. He He's had 10 assists two games in a row. Like he's he's really becoming a playmaker for the Lakers when they really don't have they don't have a lot of playmakers right now. Like without LeBron and Schroeder. Right. I mean, Caruso. Yeah, but he doesn't really have much of a shot. He's not really a, a threat, like an all purpose threat. And you're kind of seeing THT really create plays for the team when they needed it. They really needed it right now. So. Yeah, I look at him, I see little, I don't know, maybe a little bit of Kobe in there, a young, very confident guy who's willing to miss shots and make shots and, and take over the game. That kind of confidence, that kind of feeling like, give me the goddamn ball. You can't coach that. People have it or they don't, and he seems to have it. Yeah, he's got balls. He's got balls. He made a big shot in overtime the other day, too. Yeah, the, against the Knicks. Yeah, against the Knicks. Yeah, here's a question for you. Is Kuzma finally becoming 
the the third piece of the big three. I can't say he's becoming the third piece of the big three because I would still have to give that to Schroeder, and I still think what THT is doing is a little more impressive. But I will say we were coming into this with some like grades. Mm-hmm. You brought up the subject of grades. Yeah, and. I was giving Kuzma a high grade because he might not be transforming into this elite player that everyone thought he could become, like an elite scorer, like an all-star. But he's really doing the things that he wasn't doing before. Like before, he was kind of this guy with a lot of potential, but he showed some laziness in like running the floor and playing defense and doing the scrappy things. But now I really feel like he's turned into like a really solid role player. Like he's... He's going after boards. He's making cuts to the basket. He's playing hard D. He has a certain grit that he didn't have before. Mm-hmm. So that's what I that's what I'm really liking from Kuzma now is like, yeah, he may not be like the third biggest player on our team or this solidified scorer, but he's turned into like a really good role player. So you, you don't miss Brandon Ingram as much now when you look at Kuzma. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or Julius Randle. Ah, uh, him I kind of miss. Cause... Yeah, he's a beast. He's just spectacular. You know, the, the Lakers are a chemistry question right now, and they acquired Andre Drummond during the year. And when they got Marcus Gasol, Powell's brother, at the beginning of the year, I, I expected him to be a really big, I hate to use the word piece, because I always feel like it diminishes players. Like, he's a piece. Yeah, and they're all pieces. No, they're human beings, and they're trying their best to prevail as professional athletes. But with the acquisition of Andre Drummer, Montrez Harrell, and Marcus Gasol sitting there. Where do you see Marcus Gasol going forward? I, I see like I have an image that maybe he's going to win some games for them going forward. Yeah, he has like a good. I mean, he obviously won the finals with the Raptors. Like he's very experienced. Like he has a veteran mind. He makes the right plays. He can make threes. I don't really know what Frank Vogel's plan is going forward because they have you know they have Drummond like you said. Mm-hmm. They have Gasol, Montrez Harrell. They have like three big men who are pretty solid other than AD to like fill in these gaps. And I mean, for a while I was kind of like favoring Gasol over Drummond because Drummond can make some dodo head plays. He's kind of clunky with the ball sometimes. He he doesn't have a lot of finesse. Like he's very impulsive when he has the ball. And Marc Gasol, you know, plays a little bit slower, sees the game slower, makes good passes. But Drummond has a lot of talent that Marcus Gasol doesn't have. Like, Drummond is feisty, and he gets boards, and he can just score really easily. Mm-hmm. So he has this, like, athleticism that you can't really get out of Marcus Gasol. I see Frank Vogel kind of balancing them a little bit. Like, I think he's going to start Drummond in the playoffs just because, mm-hmm. I don't know, Drummond's putting up, like, 20 points, 10 rebounds, like, plenty of times in the last couple months. Like, he's solid off, you know? He makes dumb plays sometimes. But I think his talent and just being out there to, to create some spark when we when we need it, he's he's good for that. It's totally conceivable that the Lakers could come up flat and be eliminated in the playoff tournament. That's not out of the realm of possibility. It's not. Yeah. I think, especially health-wise where we're at right now, I don't know what LeBron, you know, I don't know how his ankle is. Right. To make it through four series and then potentially be playing or three series and then potentially be playing the nets for the fourth series it's like when we might be fully gassed it's gonna be hard enough to make it out of the west get through the clippers potentially you know the nuggets the suns all these great teams like usually we play the hardest team in the west but now it seems like okay we're gonna have to fight through the west with our health issues and then get to the finals and we're going to have to play a monster in the nets with a three-headed monster, you know? Right. Of course, with Andre Drummond, we don't really know how he plays with LeBron. That's still kind of an unknown. I mean, they, mm-hmm. I don't think they've played hardly one game together. So That's a good point. And there are a lot of big bodies. The Lakers have a lot of big. Yeah. And LeBron, once he's out there, he's got the ball in his hands and it's not a guard-based team anymore, really. Mm-mm. That's why I'm hoping THD can all this prep is going to pay off in the playoffs a little bit. He might be able to come in and play, you know, if LeBron's still working with a aggravated ankle a little bit, trying to play through it, I think he's going to let THT and Schroeder do some of the playmaking 
take some of the load off of his shoulders. But anyone who plays with LeBron is always better. Yeah, he's a team guy. Now, there's an, uh, one person we haven't really spoken about, and that's the coach, Vogel. He's got, I hate to use the word, because it diminishes the players, a lot of pieces out there on his chessboard. And I thought he coached really well in last year's playoffs in terms of just reacting to certain matchups and certain situations based on the other team. What's your confidence level about Coach Vogel? I mean, I have high confidence with him. He won us a championship uh-huh. in a bubble, you know. Uh, I love his culture. You know, we're still second defense in the league in points allowed, to second to the Knicks, and we beat them the other day with, you know, with all the injuries we have. So I love Frank Vogel as a coach. He's, you know, being defensive-minded. That's what wins championships at the end of the day. You know, the Raptors won a championship mm-hmm. heavily defensive focus. The Warriors they were always a really great defensive team. My only knock on Vogel this year has been his unpredictability in our lineups. Like he's, he'll go like three games without playing Montrez Harrell, and I'm like sitting back, like wondering, like where's Montrez? You know, right? He's a solid player, so he has these lapses, and and you know he'll then he'll won't then he won't play Mark Gasol for a stretch, and then Mark had to voice his grievances about you know not getting enough playing time, so. He's really been shuffling around the lineups, which is cool because it's good to experiment. But I think the players like him. I, I think he gets away with this because I think he's a good communicator behind the scenes. He doesn't seem to get into ego clashes with stars. He doesn't have the same sort of center of gravity that Phil Jackson had. And I think it's probably better for this Laker team. Your thoughts? I agree with that. Yeah, I think he's pretty even keel. He can be intense, which is good because... You kind of need someone to be like, you know, let's get our, you know, let's, right. let's dial it up defensively sometimes. Yeah, one of the things that surprised me is, you know, when he had Jason Kidd on his staff, who was a Hall of Fame guard, who was an NBA Finals coach, and there doesn't seem any competition or, or friction among the coaching staff. So he must have a really brilliant talent for um, placating championship egos beyond just on the court but in uh, in the in the coach's room as well i think he's a pretty selfless like humble dude which probably allows for that kind of environment yeah okay so let's throw some grades you mentioned some grades uh you know i thought lebron first of all i'm just going to say would have been or very likely been right in the mix as an mvp but for the fact that he hurt his ankle and ad i don't know what to say about him when he's on he's great but let's talk about some of the role players uh schroeder grade him Schroeder, I'll give him a B. Okay, and why not an A? I think he's super talented, brings a lot of speed and athleticism and playmaking that our team desperately needed right. coming out of last year, especially with all the guards in the West. But he wasn't a great leader when AD and LeBron came out. He kind of seemed like a little bit aloof. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like you know command like a Caruso would. So I kind of missed that from him a little bit. And plus this... You know, he violated COVID protocol the other day, which... Uh, what did out. he do? What happened? I don't really know. I don't think they really revealed it, or they might have, but he just, he violated it in some way and was on a 10 to 13 day uh, quarantine. And it didn't mean he got COVID. It meant that in some fashion, he exposed himself to it. So he... Exactly. He Yeah, he tested negative. He even kind of blamed the NBA on it, which I didn't love. He was like, oh, we got to fix this protocol or, you know, this, this 10 to 13 day quarantine. But... Overall, he didn't resign with us yet, so I feel like he's going to test free agency. So I, I, I like Schroeder. I mean, I'm not, I, he's just not like. He's entitled to do that. I mean, that's. Oh, it, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so. That's not a knock on him. Kuzma. Kuzma, A minus. Okay. Montrez. B minus. Caruso. Caruso, I just give him an A. There's, he's, he's great. He does exactly what we ask of him. He does. Uh-huh. He's on. He's only getting paid like three million dollars a year, right? When you when you compare that to the rest of our team, like Kuzma's getting like almost five or six million. Caruso an A because he. I think he's a, a three point, sh- a steady three point shot away from being an elite NBA player. Caruso. Yeah. Yeah. If he had a good shot, it would really help us. Right. It's a little bit. It's not there. I, I think it generally takes these guys a couple years to get that. Uh, three-point shot. And then Gasol, grade him. It's hard to grade him because he didn't play that much this year. Mm-hmm. I would say I'd say he's a, a B- minus just because he, when he did play, he didn't do a lot for our team. 
he hasn't done that much for our team this year. Right. I kind of feel like there's a moment waiting for him in the playoffs. I mean, I don't know, but it's just sort of what I feel. Yeah, I can see that. He he's he's so smart that you know he's gonna he's gonna affect our team positively in some way in the playoffs. Okay, quick uh, evaluation on the play-in tournament. Do you think that the Lakers are better off getting those extra games, hopefully to kind of solidify some chemistry? Of course, you got the risk of injury and fatigue built into those two games. What's your feeling about it for the Lakers, plus or minus? Yeah, I think the extra games is good. I think the urgency that's created from it now and in the games is going to be good. It's going to force us to like really get our stuff together mm-hmm. it, it, like in a really quick fashion. I don't think it's great for us just like because there's a potential that we could be knocked out. Right. Who knows what our chemistry is going to be with LeBron and AD back just in one game. So at least we're going to have two chances. If we lose the first game, we'll get another chance. Right. It's not single elimination. It's And I think they're the seventh seed. Uh, if they win the first game, then they've ult- automatically vaulted into the, the normal playoff bracket. Yeah, they become the seventh seed. Right. And if they lose, they could they might have to scuffle their way into the eighth seed, I believe. Yeah, then we'd play the winner of 9-10, which would be either the Spurs or Memphis right now. Right. So, so, but the Warriors are really just not that great of a team. Like Steph is obviously Steph, and he could drop sixty points if he yeah. wanted to. But I think I think we're gonna win the play-in tournament. Now, let me ask you this: Could you consider Steph as a possible MVP candidate? You could. Uh, I would throw him on my list just because of what he's doing this year and getting that team into the playoffs with the pieces that they have. But I wouldn't give him the MVP just based on the normal NBA criteria, which is like your team has to be a top, you know, top three seed in whatever conference you're in. Who is the MVP in your mind? I'm in agreement with most, uh, with most right now, and that it's Jokic. I okay, mean, Jokic. Maybe yeah, Jokic. it's his turn. What about Chris Paul? He would be my my front runner or my second, you know, right. my number two. Uh, Embiid obviously as well. Uh huh. But CP3, I mean. The Suns were like, they were the 10th seed in the West last year without him. And now he's brought him to the two, the second best record in the whole league. Right. Okay, Utah and Phoenix, they're sitting atop the standings. You look at that and you go, is that real? Are they really the top in the elite? Do they scare you? Are they for real? You know, I'm not really afraid of them, to be honest. Like, Utah's got great chemistry. Like, uh-huh. if, the, if the Lakers weren't in contention, I would say, yeah, they have a good shot at making the finals. Right. But... I don't know. You saw the you saw the Lakers, you, you saw the Lakers beat the Suns the other day with without LeBron without Schroeder, right? You know, and the Suns had CP three and and Devin Booker. So I think the Lakers. You know, when you have LeBron, I mean, people have him as the best player of all time for a reason. Right. He can change any team, and he knows how to win. I mean, he he's for all his ability, he always finds a way to prevail and to win, especially at least to get out of his. His conference. Now, of course, the big question that's out there for L.A. Hoopmeisters, is this the year that the Clippers and the Lakers finally converge in the playoffs? Last year, it it was supposed to happen, but it didn't. It could very well happen in in the Lakers' first round. Oh, with the Clippers? Yeah. Yeah, that would be... Honestly, I want to see that because it was so hyped up last year. Oh, Western Conference Championship, Lakers-Clippers. I want to see it actually happen. You know, I want to take down the Clippers. But I don't think it can happen in the finals. I don't, it depends how the brackets work because I... Oh, yeah. Well, if the Lakers are the 8th or the 7th, they would play the the Suns in the first round. And then I think the Clippers are... So it could be a second round. Seed. Yeah, it could be a second round type of thing. So can what's your... Just quickly, uh, you know, as you look at the Clippers with their history and, the, you know, they can't get out of the second round... <laughs> Does that mean anything to you, or could they be? Uh, could they get out of the West? Uh, God, it's it's hard to tell. But I, personally, I think that I think that their curse is a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Real. Okay. <laughs> now we the Red Sox were cursed for a hundred years for trading Babe Ruth, which was you know that you deserve a hundred year curse when you trade Babe Ruth. But I don't know what the Clippers did to deserve their curse. I'm not sure. Maybe you can tell they me. They should have just not been in a Laker town. I mean, yeah, the the city is big enough to have two NBA teams, but you're going up against the most winningest franchise in the history of the league. So you're mm-hmm. always going to be compared 
there's so many teams that like haven't done anything in the league, but they're not compared constantly to their big brother who's you know right. has all the greatest players and the most championships, tied most championships. So I think they're always just in the shadow of the Lakers, which just doesn't help. So anytime they lose, it's like, oh, they're cursed. They should have gone down to San Diego like they were. Well, they actually were originally. Well, the, the Clippers, I think they started in Buffalo. They moved to San Diego before they came to Los Angeles. They could have been like the Padres, you know, just sniping at the Lakers' heels from San Diego. Uh, I just don't think they play enough good defense to win the championship. Like, forget the curse. I just Like, they're a, a really great offensive team, and I think Rondo is really going to help them in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. And honestly, them and the Blazers are who I'm most afraid of. The Blazers? Mm-hmm. If the Lakers, like if LeBron's still kind of aggravated and he's not 100%, which doesn't sound like he's going to be 100%, I'm afraid of the Blazers and the Clippers. Is there a possibility that 95% of LeBron James is actually more detrimental that, you know, because, you know, he'd be trying to do too much assuming more responsibility that he can actually handle? Are, are there some risks out there? Yeah, I mean, you've seen it with Kevin Durant, Clay Thompson, mm-hmm. playing with injuries and getting worse injuries because of it. So I think there's always, you know, there's always a risk when you're pushing yourself through something else. So uh, you, we saw it with Kobe. Well, he wasn't really fighting another injury, but... But he was worn down that year. And when his, he, he was I, worn down And D'Antoni just brutalized him, I thought. Yeah, yeah D'Antoni. It, it was like... He was a racehorse at Santa Anita. They, I'm surprised they didn't just come out and shoot him after he, you know, broke down. LeBron is so like self aware though. Like I don't think he's. I mean, obviously things just happened when right. you're playing hundred. You know, you're going hundred miles an hour, you know, uh-huh. LeBron James. But he's like super self aware with his body, and like I don't think he's going to be diving for loose balls and jumping after you know over players all the time. Like I think he's going to be pretty. Uh, at least in the first couple series, like I think. I think he goes all out in the play-in tournament to try to get us into the, the playoffs. But then when the seven-game series start, I think you kind of see him like, just kind of like he did last playoffs, he didn't go full throttle in the first game of every series. Like, we lost the first game of the first couple couple series, yeah. Right. So I, I would expect the same thing for him to kind of gradually ease in. Once they, assuming they get in, out of the play-in tournament, then every series is seven games. It's not like there's a five-game series, the first one. Is that right? I'm not sure. Yeah, no, it's all seven. It'll be entertaining to see what kind of chemistry is going to emerge. Yeah, like last year, we were the best team in the West the whole year. We were the right. one seed. Right. And we had that chemistry established. And then, of course, COVID, and we had the long break. But then we were able to snap right back into it. Now, our whole year has been up and down. No no real consistency. Nothing for us to, like, hang our hat on, you know, except right. for last year's run. But we have different pieces. And, of course, you've got the fatigue factor and that the, the, the season, the timing of each season is now off. They had less rest. You could feel that that irked LeBron, that he, he felt like, I need more time to recharge after this season. Now, speaking of COVID, what are your people telling you about who's vaccinated on these teams? Because that could be a huge factor if somebody pops positive, you know, and didn't get vaccinated or or, or whatever. What are you hearing about the Lakers in terms of vaccination? I haven't heard too much about, like, who is vaccinated or it doesn't seem like they want to reveal any of that information. Mm -hmm. I'm not really exactly sure why. Still seems like they're taking it pretty seriously, though. Like for Schroeder, like, but I, I personally think that like, it's just another element of like health. You know, it's like whoever can stay healthy in the playoffs, whoever can take this shit seriously and right. and stay masked, stay quarantined, like that's the team. You know, it's just another part of the game now. It's like right, it's another factor. So it seems to me, if you if why. If you can have that extra layer of protection, why not get it? But we're just not hearing about it. Like Lou Will going to the strip club before the before the bubble last year and getting, you know, being forced to quarantine, like that hurt the Clippers ultimately. And that was a, you know, that was a dumb move by him. So right. Schroeder, I wasn't happy that he violated protocol, you know, with this stretch of games that could have potentially taken us out of the plan. So that was a little bit like, come on, Schroeder, what are you doing? Right. But who knows really what happened. And now there's another half of the league, not that I really care about it or follow <laughs> it, but 
they're out there and it deserves our attention as we break down the NBA playoffs or at least the, from the Laker point of view. And that's the East. And of course, the team that commands all the attention in the East is the newly configured uh, New Jersey Nets with Harden, Durant, and Kyrie. We might be the favorites according to Vegas, but I mean, they have three superstars. Right. They should be the favorites. The pressure is a little bit on them right now to win it, I think. Right. And so, are other guys functioning and greased and ready to go? Is Durant healthy? What, I mean, what is Durant this year? I haven't really seen him. He's been playing the last month or so, and he's been kind of back to Durant level of play. I just don't see how we're going to guard. Like, I don't think we have anybody to guard any of those guys. Like, realistically, like LeBron could guard KD, yes, but it'll be very exhausting for him, mm-hmm. especially grieving an injury. Kyrie... I don't know who would guard Kyrie. Caruso and Schroeder would have to like maybe double team him or something. And then Harden. I just don't think we have anybody to really defend them individually. But as a team, we might be able to, you know, I trust Vogel and his schemes. He's going to have to really come up with some kind of genius plan on defense. To- now there's, can the Nets get out of the East? There's a good Philadelphia team. There's uh Doc Rivers is Philadelphia 76ers, and you got, you know, Milwaukee, who's, who's mm-hmm. been in the mix. It's not necessarily a cakewalk for those teams, which presumably have better chemistry going forward than the Nets, although I don't know. Honestly, I yeah, if I had to bet on anyone other than the Nets to make it, I would, I feel like it could be Milwaukee's year. I mean, they've fallen short of expectations the last two, three years in a row where they were the number one seed, mm-hmm. and they got beat by Boston or the heat last year. So I think for them, they might have more of a chip on their shoulder this year, being the three seed and kind of seeing the Nets. The Nets not might might not have the chemistry that they have, like you said. So I could see the I could see Milwaukee making a run. But ultimately I think, you know, if we make it to the finals, the Lakers, they're gonna be gassed. Because they're gonna have to play the Clippers, they're gonna have to play a lot of these good teams in the West. And after three series in the West and then coming to play the Nets, I don't know. I, it's going to be really tough. I don't. I don't think it's. I, it's not like last year where oh we we're playing the Heat and we're by far the best team. We had the best chemistry. The Clippers found a way to lose before they even playing us. I think this is going to be a lot tougher of a road, especially with our with our injuries. But I still think we have a really decent shot at making it. I think this is a chance for AD to really elevate himself into yeah he's a superstar but maybe he's an all-time player and this would be a year for him to maybe make the case for that i agree with that statement because he did that last year in the playoffs he really showed out i mean he hit that buzzer beating game against the nuggets right he was super solid the whole playoffs and the finals right obviously lebron was the alpha male you know like the guy but if he does it back-to-back years and helps us win a championship, then yeah, he goes into that all-time great, all-time great Laker category almost. Now, speaking of all-time great Lakers this Saturday, posthumously, Kobe Bryant goes into uh, the Basketball Hall of Fame, and you're an L.A. millennial, so his career pretty much coincided with your youth. I have vivid memories of his picture, uh, his painting, or his likeness above your bed. I think it probably made um, the trip to your new place. Maybe if you could just reflect on not so much his career, but his effect on your life, uh, not just in basketball and sports, but just in a whole way, a whole just range of things. He just made you feel like anything was possible. Like you could wake up and get better at every day at whatever it is you wanted to become. Mm-hmm. He just made you feel like there's a will, there's a way. Like if the, if you really believe in yourself and and you have a goal and you want to achieve it, there's nothing stopping you other than yourself. And that was kind of like the Kobe, you know, the Mamba mentality, the relentless, the relentless pursuit of greatness. You know, like mm-hmm. one of my favorite quotes from him is the I don't know if you remember like the last speech he had um, on his last game uh, when he. When he scored all the points. Yeah, when he scored 60. Yeah. He said that the he said that the journey is the dream. Like the the fi- there's no the final destination isn't the dream, but the journey is the dream. Right. I like to say your process is your reward. Yeah. 
Exactly. And if you can, and I mean, that's a challenge, especially in show business where you're always thinking, well, I got to get this or make this or I want to get the Oscar. No, your reward is right now practicing your clarinet or writing the script or right now I am being rewarded amply with this uh, uh, conversation with Jake. So process and reward aren't two separate things. They're, there's, they're, they're kind of an equivalence, almost like equals MC squared, energy and matter. They're two things that are actually a reflection of a, a certain kind of sameness process reward. So that's your takeaway. Yeah, that's my, yeah. That quote has stuck with me forever. It's like, you know, when you get up and you don't want to do the shit that will ultimately help you, that, that moment is like that, you know, that's, that's the dream or that's, the process, like you said. Now, for those of you that don't only know Jake from his sports acumen, he's also a brilliant composer and musician. He has um, more than competency across a whole series of instruments, including engineering, which I could use some help with. <laughs> um, how's that going for you? It's good. Yeah. My new, just like doing my new show on the radio was kind of like giving me more time to focus on um, on you know the craft of writing and producing songs and yeah I'm just trying to like just create as much as I possibly can try to have as much creative output as possible and and then you know and and just look at that and decide from there it's like it's easy to get hung up on like not being inspired or like you know that all that kind of stuff uh -huh. all the excuses that come with the creative process right but once you just get in the you know get in the lab and and just put some stuff together, you can look back at it and say, oh, you know what, maybe I wasn't feeling creative that day, but what I actually made is quality. There's something in there that I can go back to and, and refine. So it's just it's just fun, like trying to figure out how to how to do it. It's a discipline of showing up for yourself every day. Like you, your, your discipline is no less than somebody who sells insurance. They actually have to show up and be at work every day. I think that for creative people, sometimes they fall short of that standard and it's important if you really are committed to that that journey, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And where can people find you? You're on the air. You're a radio personality. I hear you're hiding out in Bakersfield on the radio. <laughs> uh, tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, so I pretty much started as kind of like a social media guy, uh -huh. doing uh, helping out with the socials. And I had a five-minute sports segment Monday and Friday, yeah. NFL segment. Uh huh. And the station wanted to continue and use me in more ways. And I started doing overnights in Bakersfield. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you no, know, now I'm fully transitioned to every weekday, 3 to 7 p.m., Classic Hits, Q92.1. Well, you know what they say, what's the song? If you can make it in Bakersfield, you can make it anywhere. Or was that New York? I don't know. It was one of those songs. Bakersfield, Bakersfield, or New York, New York. They're interchangeable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, a lot of people go to New, from New York actually go to Bakersfield. Actually, Bakersfield, sports-wise, is famous for Frank Gifford, who was an NFL football player and the voice of Monday Night Football, hailed from Bakersfield by way of... USC. I think we've had a pretty in-depth sort of look at, at the Lakers and their chances. I'm going to throw out some possibilities and you give me the odds. Out of the play-in tournament, what are the odds? Into the playoffs? Yeah, they prevail out of the play-in tournament. I'd say... Percentage-wise or... Oh, I'd say 90, 95% chance. Okay. Out of the, out of the first round? <laughs> playing the Suns, 80, 80 percent. Okay, maybe the second. What's it? Was the first round, second round, and then the conference final? Wait, is that it? One, two, three. It's four series for getting the playoff tournament, right? Okay, so Western Conference Finals, getting there. I'm honestly, I'm just gonna. The Lakers are gonna win the championship. They're okay, gonna, they're gonna repeat. <laughs> so you're all in. I'm all in. I'm yeah. all in. I might be one of those delusional Laker fans. I probably am, but I think they're gonna. So the pieces are gonna fall into place, and they're gonna find their chemistry and their talent will prevail. I thought we got a hint of that when they played Phoenix the other day. It was like, well, they're just better. Yeah, I mean, we didn't have we didn't have our top three. LeBron, AD, and Schroeder, and right. we still beat them, you know? Okay, and one last final thought, skipping away from the NBA, which I think you've covered brilliantly. I'm a Cal graduate. I went to Berkeley, so I, I definitely had a little bit of a sore spot when the, the, the Rams unloaded Jared Goff. Um, and maybe I was a little naive and was looking at him through rose-colored glasses, but the guy got the Rams to the Super Bowl. That's not a common accomplishment in the NFL. I don't care who you are. 
He won a bunch of playoff games and division championships. He showed some weaknesses and he, he was on his own growth journey. I am one of those few that was not in favor of that. And maybe I'm prejudiced, you know, the trade out for Matthew Stafford. I think if they had a better quarterback, they would have won that Super Bowl. Like, I like Goff. Mm -hmm. Like, he's really, he's in a, a beautiful passer. Like, a beautiful, a beautiful passer of the football. But I just think, like, mentally, when you get to the, you know, when you get to the Super Bowl, I mean, granted, he played the Patriots and Bill Belichick, but I don't think he was just, I don't think he got into a place where uh, Sean McVay was, you know, was happy with. So I, I'm fine with the move, honestly. I think Matt Stafford is more experienced. Um, they're kind of similar, but... Uh, <laughs> There goes the, it, well, it, the it, neighbors. When you have these high-end uh, television studio apartments and the trash people come, you get some competition for the audio. We'll keep it going. Anyway, week, what you're saying. Week three, though, uh, Lions come to, to, La -La. Come to L.A. Yeah, that'll be a great game. With some chips on some shoulders, to be sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I think what this does is it puts the responsibility now for the, the Rams on McVeigh. Like, okay, you got the guy you wanted. You were a little frustrated with Goff. You didn't maybe get to use all the all the paintbrushes in your little uh, quiver because he had some limitations in your mind. Well, now you've got the guy you've lusted for, so now it's on you, coach. Yeah, I mean, I can't say Matt Stafford is his dream quarterback or anything, but mm -hmm. I think maybe it fills a hole that Jared Goff wasn't you know, wasn't feeling. Right. And also one little rebuttal to what you said, Aaron Rodgers also lost to Brady this year. That's true. You know, without Belichick. He's uh, upset about it. Clearly he wants out. Yeah. I think Brady just kind of like makes a lot of people unhappy <laughs> because no one can beat him. Yeah. He just wins. It's not like he's statistically overwhelming or even aesthetically overwhelming. He just wins. And that's the metric in sports. It's W's and L's. Everything else is window dressing, in my opinion. You know, Kobe's passing came right on the heels of the COVID catastrophe. Mm -hmm. It was just like, bam, and then bam. And in a way, we didn't really maybe fully get to process what that meant with Kobe because of what came after. Have you been able to? I, don't, I haven't been able to fully process it. I mean, it was just so sudden and shocking and honestly i feel like the nba hasn't covered it enough as one of their topics like i would have loved to see more commemorations to him in the finals broadcast mm -hmm. there wasn't enough just like talking about him and kind of I'm, I'm sure there will be this year hopefully but hasn't fully hit me i don't think it ever will just because it was you know kobe's kind of like invincible in, in all Lakers fans minds so to see him go it didn't make any sense no it didn't and then the timing of it because just within really weeks of what happened our whole society was shut down and we dealt with the level of mortality that was way beyond the scale of one terrible unfortunate accident I frankly would have liked to have had Kobe here for COVID I think he would have been a big help. Be that as it may, the fates intervened. And I want to thank you, Jake, for hanging with me here. We got to do this again as we approach other sports moments that require your analysis and in-depth observations. I so appreciate you being here, brother. Thanks so much. You are the best. Keep it going. Till next time. Namaste. Shalom and aloha. By that, I mean, yeah, you know. <laughs> namaste. Aloha. Thanks for having me on, Phil. You got it, bro.